Good evening, everyone. Good evening. <laughs> uh, tonight's presentation and all of our presentations are brought to you by Carib Trans. They are also responsible for our live streaming events, so we'd also like to welcome all of our viewers online. So thank you, Carib Trans. Yay! And tonight's speaker, Ian McGaw, is hosted by Cloudbreak Villa. So a round of applause for Cloudbreak. And as always, we'd like to thank Prince Bernhard Culture Funds and Public Entity SABA for their support over the years. And all of our sponsors. We have 55 sponsors in total this year. So a big round of applause for everyone who makes this event possible. And if you have your phones with you, now's the time to take it out. Scan the QR code on the left. It's a new online mobile platform called I'll Explore SABA, set up by the California Academy of Sciences. It features hiking and diving, different heritage and cultural uh, and natural institutions on the island. There's interviews with local community members. So check it out. They're looking for feedback. So you can also submit that to Laurel Allen. Her email is in the platform. Raffle tickets. We are selling $5 raffle tickets at all of our presentations. You can also visit us at the tent anytime between 8 and 4. Final night is Friday, and we will be doing the draw after the final presentation. So make sure you purchase your raffle tickets before then. Upcoming events. We just have a few more left. Tomorrow, we have a double feature of field projects. At 1 o'clock, you can go on a dive with our stingray expert, Katie Flowers, who finally just arrived on island this morning after being stuck in St. Martin for a few days. So yay! <laughs> and then tomorrow night, our crab expert uh, will be leading us on a night hike to find some land crabs. Um, he'll talk about that a little bit more during his presentation. And then finally, on Friday night is closing night at Busy Bee, and that will also be with our Stingray expert. So make sure you come on Friday. And if you participate in any of our field projects, you can receive a free t-shirt or tank top made with recycled plastics. And how many of you are drinking Cloud Top out there? Yay! Save us new beer. So if you haven't already, we have free samples at all of our presentations. And you can purchase them either at the presentations or at any of the bars and restaurants on the island. And now, before we get to our main event, we have two people who are working on reforestation projects on the island of Saba. They're both project managers. And first up will be Anna Keen, who is one of our local artists. She does Indigo, Shibori. Um, you can visit her at the studio. But she's also the project manager for the Relief Saba program, which is part of the Saba Conservation Foundation. So please welcome Anna. Relief Saba. Double entendre there. Say it out loud. Um, I don't do this well. I'm old school. I have one other slide. I don't know how to make it come up. Emily, <laughs> we're. Oh, yeah? yeah? Here we go. Okay. All right. Can you hear me now? Because I can do it without the microphone if I have to. Too many years of teaching. I do have notes because I can get off track, so I want to stay on track because I don't, we don't have a lot of time because we want you to get to the good stuff. But I want to start off by thanking See and Learn for letting us give our information out to you because this is a community-based project, believe it or not. Um, I am Anna Keen. I am the project manager. I have two... Uh, Forest Rangers, Luke Hassel and Akeem Winston, who work with me. They do all the stuff that this old body can't do, and we're getting things done. Um, just a little bit of history on the, on the project. Um, Stacia has been doing a reforestation project now for about six years, and in, their, in this current round of funding, they included SABA in the funding program. 
So we started in April. I joined the project in um, June. Um, it is a European Union funded project, so there's gobs of paperwork, which is what I do, which is not my favorite thing, but uh, there we go. Um, the, I'm going to read this, so let me change my glasses. Oh, God, they're all fogged up. <laughs> Hang on. So, oh, thank you. <laughs> so um, this project, and I'm quoting now, aims to enhance Seba and Stacia's ability to respond to the needs of the marine environment through reforestation, which will improve the ecosystem services, biodiversity, and economic resilience of the islands. Basically what all those big words mean, that we are going to prevent runoff from going into the sea and mucking it up by planting a lot of trees where we have issues. Um, we can't get to all of them, of course, but we're going to do the best we can. <coughs> we have several plots that we are involved with right now. Um, we are working down at the Fort Bay behind the gas station and along the sea um, side of the road where they've started, the agricultural department started planting some palm trees. We're going to continue on up with some more palm trees and sea grapes up in there. Um, the sulfur mine area, if you've, ever, if you've been down there lately, you'll notice that there's a whole bunch of fence posts stuck in the ground that the Marines, bless their hearts, came and put in for us. We're still waiting on the fencing. Um, we're not actually going to be planting that area specifically. We're going to fence out the goats and seed bomb it. You know what seed bombs are? Get a bunch of dirt and put some seeds in there and throw them out there. Um, to see how Mother Nature can take care of herself as far as uh, things growing back without the influence of the goats. Um, we're working below the road there at the big curve going into St. John's in Giles Quarter. Um, that is in conjunction with the government as well, with the public entity. We're going to be planting along there, down below the wall. Um, the top of the mountain, we're going to try and restore as much of the mountain mahogany as we can. It's a very, very important species up there. It's the top of the mountain is Saber's sponge, basically. That's what collects and holds the moisture that we get. The botanical garden, which is attached to the trail shop, which is now fenced, although we still have a few goat issues there every now and then. But uh, that's going to be our food forest. We're going to be planting local species like soursop and sugar apple and cocoa trees and things like that as an as a, uh, educational experience for people. There will be signage to say what it is and, and then how it grows and what we do with it. We're also doing some gardening up at the top. Um, we also just now I just got word that we will be able to um, do some reforestation on Dias Hill. The woman who owns the property up there at the top of the, uh, the hill there has agreed to let us do some reforestation up there. So we have lots of plots and lots of things to do and not a whole lot of time to do them in, but we're going to do as much as we can with what the time we've got. Um, if you're walking the road and you see the little relief sign there on the, on the fence that's on the top of the system, take a peek over and you can see um, our propagation house. We've got uh, a, a propagation house specifically and then a lot of the things are outside now. We have over 1,000 baby trees in pots right now. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Um, we're trying to plant as much native species. We don't want to reforest with imports. And of course, there are so many things on the island that have been imported that have become naturalized that it's kind of hard to make that distinction. But locally, we're planting things like white cedar, yellow elder, water mampu, or what they call the blatty tree here. Um, 
we also, of course, are putting in some July trees and sea grapes and the Geiger trees for a little variety and some color because who wants to be bored out of their mind with all the green, you know? Um, <laughs> we are still constantly collecting seeds as they come ripe and planting seeds, so we are continuing to develop our seed bank and our native plants. Um, you can come and adopt your own tree. You come by, if the gate's open, you can come by and pick up a, a tree. Uh, we just ask for a small donation if you feel like it. Um, we also have been working with the Junior Rangers Club and the Snorkel Club. They came, they planted seeds, they potted them up now, and they'll be able to take them home um, before Christmas holiday so they, they can plant their own trees, start young, train them right. Um, I, that's pretty much it. I just want to remind you all that we do not plant trees for ourselves. We plant trees for our children and our grandchildren. So that's what this project is all about, so that we have a more sustainable um, environment here on SEVA. That's it. I'm going to turn it over to Justin now, and he's going to talk about the government, and he's going to do the young presentation, which is really pretty spiffy. I did the old one. So here you go. Thanks a lot, Anna. Thanks, Anna. Uh, let's see. Oh, wow. And that's it. We're done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, burp, 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 burp. There we go. Let's see if I can just uh, get this uh, going up. Okay, uh, so good evening uh, everyone and welcome to uh, this night's of uh, See and Learn. Uh, thank you for coming out. How's everyone doing? Good. We got some uh, enthusiastic attendees. Great. Uh, my name is Justin Simmons de Young. I am a project manager at a uh, local government, so that's public entity SEBA. And I'm the project manager for its uh, reforestation project, so that's what I'll be. Uh, presenting to you guys on. Um, we're not fancy like SEF with their puns, so our, we're quite uh, practical and literal, so it's just a, a reforestation project. Uh, so with uh, a lot of stories on Seba, they oftentimes begin with goats, and uh, this story is uh, a bit no different actually. So for quite a, a long time on Seba, we've had a a lot of uh, an issue, a long-standing issue with Roman goats onto the island. And in more recent years, what we've seen is due to climate change, we've uh, started to experience a lot more of the extended dry periods, which are coupled with more brief and intense uh, periods of, of rainfall. Um, and what we see is with uh, the overgrazing from the, from the Roman goats and the less rainfall, uh, over time, what we started to see was a complete change in the in the Sabin landscape. Um, we saw a lot. We started to see a lot of widespread erosion erosion throughout the island, and also um, runoff. We also uh, started to notice that uh, there was a limited expansion of the existing forests on the island. And what we also saw was that um, the impact of the goats is that uh, yeah, they kind of impacted the, the ecology of the of the vegetation zones on the island, and you saw that, uh, yeah, for example, only certain types of trees or, or uh, grasses or bush would grow, because that was the, the type of plants that the goats wouldn't eat. So anything that was edible, you know, they would uh, come along and eat it up. So we, uh, with these uh, two uh, factors, leading up to this in the year 2020, the Ministry of Agriculture nature and food security in the Netherlands, together with uh, local governments and uh, key stakeholders in the region in nature conservation, these, they put together a nature and environment policy plan. And this is where I will do my little, I want to make sure I get it correct, I'm going to do like Anna and read off so I make sure I get it correct. The goal of the nature and environment policy plan is to ensure the sound management of the natural environment that facilitates the responsible and sustainable use of the natural resources on the islands of the Caribbean Netherlands. And one of its uh, first, it has four goals. Its first strategic goal is to reverse the trend of coral reef degradation. And in that, um, the way 
one way of uh, addressing that is its first uh, target, 1.1, which is uh, to uh, control erosion and runoff, which is the issue that we have on the island. Uh, so in Actually, in 2020, what Seba government did was they started a, a goat control pro project to remove the free roaming goats onto the island. And what was nice is that actually we saw, we started in the Mount Scenery National Park. And once the goats were removed, uh, coincidentally, it was uh, coupled by a, a nice period of rainfall. And what we saw was just an abundance of, of grass uh, coming up on the hillsides where it just wasn't growing there before, so that was quite nice. And we thought, I'd say about government, well, you know, as we remove the goats, we can allow nature to recover on its own, or we could, in a way, help boost that process. Um, and also, it could be a nice way to show the public uh, and the people of Seba um, what uh, the island can come to once uh, the, the Roman goats are removed onto the island. So. Uh, what we did was we got together, we wrote a, a, a project plan, and we submitted it to the Ministry of Agriculture. Um, it was approved with a budget, and that's how we started off with the, um, with the reforestation project. The project itself, the goal is to boost the, re to boost the recovery process and expand upon Seba's existing forests in order to reduce the land-based pressures of erosion and runoff, which impacts Seba's coral reefs and increase the availability of local food production. Our aim is basically to plant uh, 5,000 trees. Uh, a portion of those will be uh, fruit trees, and we want to do this in three years. So Anna, when you, you know, if you don't want to do anything with those 1,000 seedlings, just, <laughs> just, just come on over. <laughs> um, and basically what we did was we... Uh, yeah, we, we divided the project in three components, which is the first one is the creation of wild forests, which I'll talk about in the, in the coming slides, local food production, and uh, beautification. So with the creation of wild forests, what we want to do is, as I said earlier, we want to kind of uh, expand upon the existing forests that are here. Um, and we want to create wild forests that are healthy and resilient. And so like uh, the SEF, we will use a native tree species on the island. Uh, a lot are sea grape, white cedar, the gumbo limbo, um, West Indian mahogany, uh, fig trees, bladdy, ganip, um, fiddlewood to name a few. We've got more on our list. And the idea is, is that we will try to um, grow these from seeds because that helps to ensure the genetic diversity and also the, the health of the forest and the resilience of it. Our project team consists, well, it's quite small right now, actually. It's me, and I have a half of a worker, so I just use his top half right now because his hands are useful. I'm, I'm kidding. Um, he's actually shared with another project, and next week I'll get uh, my uh, another full-time worker, so that's when we will really kick off with the seed collection, the seeding, and, and the planting, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll, as things pick up more, we'll add on a third uh, reforestation ranger. And what we have is, uh, for the nursery, we have two sites. Uh, we will make use of a greenhouse that is at the agriculture station, and that's uh, yeah from the agriculture department. It's not uh, a big one, and the intention was not actually to uh, for reforestation purposes. It's actually to carry out the activities of the agriculture department, but they were kind enough to uh, uh, allow us to use it. So we'll start there with the seeding and get the little the, the young trees growing. And at a certain point, what we'll do is um, we will transition them out to uh, where we have a hydroponics farm project because we have quite a lot of space up there. And what's nice is, is that the trees will yeah, they'll be moved from a more protected environment to one where they're a bit more exposed to the open environment. And this will toughen them up because uh, we need them yeah, to be a bit tough for the moment when they go to outplanting in the, in the harsher open environment of Seba. Uh, outplanting. Uh, will take place, uh, it depends on, the, it can vary uh, by the species of plant, but it's about uh, 1.5 to 2 years of age of the plants. And the target areas are, well, basically areas that are uh, high in erosion, um, place, uh, areas that have degraded tropical dry forests. And because, uh, yeah, land ownership is a bit complex on Seba, sometimes it's a little difficult, as Anna knows, to find the plots to reforest. So what we want to do is basically look for places that we know that no one will ever want to build there. Because it's quite a commitment you know, when you ask people to uh, yeah, have us use your land to, 
to develop a forest and it takes quite some years for a forest to reach its full maturity and that's yeah sometimes things in life change and people will uh, yeah make decisions that we don't want to yeah put down the trees that we've worked really hard to grow uh, and once they're out planted um, the aftercare, uh, this is the critical part of it because once you're out there in the open environment, they're, you know, they're at risk for a lot of things. So the aftercare is really important to just make sure that they um, survive in, in, the, in the open and that's another 1.5 to 2 years of uh, care. Uh, so for the, uh, the full disclosure, um, this is my crazy Aunt Rita and she has in no way, shape or form um, contributed to the production of that avocado that she is holding in her hand. Um, but the, uh, with the local food production component of the reforestation project, what we wanted to do uh, at Sabar Government is take several actions that we can do to improve food security on island because a lot of the fruits and vegetables that we eat on island are imported um, and they come in once a week on a boat and basically they depend on global agriculture and supply chains. Everything to go right for us to be able to eat our food on this little slice of paradise. And with, yeah, we've seen with hurricanes, the pandemics, that, that these supply chains are quite vulnerable. So we want to make sure that we, as an island, are quite resilient and, and start moving towards self-sustainability. Um, so with this part of the project, it's the idea is to reduce dependency on imports and improve self-sufficiency and food security. And the idea that we have for this is um, we want to promote backyard farming, which is something that has been traditionally done on Sebab throughout history. Um, and one of the first things that we will do is in November, we'll have an event where we've brought in some really nice grafted fruit trees from uh, one of the biggest nurseries in South Florida. And uh, we'll, yeah, we'll have an event and people, anyone who wants a nice fruit tree for their uh, yard can come in and pick up a, a fruit tree and uh, take it in, uh, yeah, in a couple of years, uh, you'll have some fruits, hopefully, if all goes well. Uh, we'll also, yeah, uh, and we'll also use uh, local fruit trees as well. Like the SCF will also, um, our, our aim is to develop food forests, um, one ideally in each village on the island, um, so that we can, uh, yeah, have some, yeah, a sustainable way of producing food as well. And then the third part of the project is beautification, which is something Anna already talked on talked about and well as part of a government it has a lot of responsibilities and part of that is carrying out activities to ensure that the infrastructure that um, provide public services for uh, the residents and visitors on Seba are all in working condition and this means that sometimes you have to carry out some construction activities and we all know, you know with construction that yeah you you uh, yeah you kind of take away from nature and sometimes it's not the most beautiful thing that you get back in the place. So what we thought with this part of the project, it would be quite nice that uh, in places where we have uh, different construction activities taking place, we want to uh, just put back a, a lot of flowering trees. So we'll have the flamboyant, uh, some geiger, lignum vitae, which is a much slower growing tree, but we'll have white cedar as well. One of the pl first places that we'll start with is if you came in by plane, I'm not sure, or maybe by, by the boat. Uh, we're, one of the projects that we have is uh, we're widening the, the road at the airport. And so we're ex uh, widening the road, we're putting back a wall. And what's nice is we'll just plant some, uh, some Geiger trees along the way, along with white cedar once we have the young uh, trees up and, and growing. And a really important part of this project is the community engagement, the education and awareness, because we really want uh, the community to feel a part of this project and, and all, also a kind of ownership with it as well. Um, and one of the ways that you start with that is from the, the ground up and that's with the youth of Seba. So we want to make sure that there's a lot of field trips to the nursery and the reforestation sites. We'll have uh, shadow programs and internships for some of the students, especially those like in the, in the high school. Uh, we will also have available summer jobs for students who uh, are abroad studying and come back for a, a summer break. We recently had a, a student who uh, is studying abroad in the Netherlands and she is uh, she's studying environmental sciences and as part of her summer job she got tasked with the assignment to provide an advice to our executive council on what could be a good method to uh, revegetate the area of where the new uh, harbor will be built. So it was, yeah, it was, yeah, as a new student uh, in that field it was a 
a really big project and really, I think, exciting and fun for her. So this is things that we want to really do as well. We'll have a lot of out planting events um, once we have our trees ready for that. Um, we want to make sure that uh, we involve the island residents, but also visitors as well. Um, we'll also, like the SCF, have an adopted tree program. Um, and part of it is that any information that comes to us, we want to make sure that it's transferred and embedded into the local community. So we'll also have like fruit tree grafting workshops uh, and also we'll try to get some workshops on uh, agroforestry as well. And yeah, the whole purpose of this is to um, embed knowledge into the island community to, and to inspire our young people to pursue careers in nature conservation, agriculture, because there's not enough of them. So we need more of them. And that's uh, it for my uh, presentation. Yeah, thank you. So if you have any questions, or I can just go back over here, it's quite fine. <laughs> Lynn, hi, yeah? Could you just explain how the two reforestation programs are working together? Maybe repeat the question yeah. for the live streaming audience. Yeah, so what we want to, uh, yeah, it's, you, you think it's kind of silly or it's such a small island and we have two projects. But the idea is, is that we actually complement each other and uh, the SEF, they're, in a bit, they're a bit further ahead of us. And we just want to make, yeah, uh, we have the si similar goals, but we want to complement where we, where we can and we don't want to, yeah, have any overlap, Anna. And, and because we're far enough, far enough ahead of them, and we keep, plant, we keep planting things. I don't know if you can hear me, but in the back. Um, when our part of the project is over, our trees, whatever we didn't get planted, are gonna move over to their part of the project. So it's really yeah. a joint project, um, particularly like Giles Porter, we're gonna share water tanks and, and those yeah. kind of things. So we're working actively together in that respect. Yeah, and just to be clear, uh, as Anna said, um, the SCF's project is uh, EU funded, whereas ours is funded um, through the Nature and Environment Policy Plan by the Ministry of Agriculture, Nature and Food Quality in the Netherlands. So they, they, have, a, they have more longevity than we do at this point. So that's one of the major differences is they've got the government behind them. We just have <laughs> the EU and they say, okay, you're done now. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anything else? Sally? Uh, you're concentrating on trees. Is, uh, is this going to be broadened into um, vegetable gardening, you know, well, self-sufficiency in growing our own yeah. crops? Well, part of the food forest is that it's, uh, yeah, you, uh, they're, they're de designed in such a way that you mimic the natural ecology of an uh, actual forest with layering of different trees where you get like the taller ones that produce a certain fruit. Uh, you get smaller ones and you kind of keep on going down the line until it's about seven layers that you get to, uh, yeah, vine crops and, and tubers and things like that. So it, it's, it's it, all of that is included into the, into the, and it's uh, the one thing with the food forest is that it takes a bit to get them going, but once you do, they're supposed to be almost self-sustaining. So there's not that much human input that's supposed to go in there. And then you say those being very good at their own potatoes. Yes. Yes. That, which unfortunately seems to have slightly died back. Yeah, well this will, I mean, in a way we kind of, that, that traditional way of farming is almost in a way like something of, of a food forest and into the field of agroforestry. So it's something that, yeah, we, that you can keep that tradition going and alive um, as we also explore different and more modern techniques to, uh, for, for food production on the island. Yeah, you have to diversify. Yes? Sorry? They're being cold. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's an ongoing process. The, the project is still ongoing, so it's yeah, it's. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, it's the big game hunters that yeah. go to Africa to do that. We could do that here, sure. Yeah. Let's, we, we need to talk well, about that. A it's a niche market. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs>
Okay, yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Justin and Anna. Sorry, Anna. Okay, I hope you guys like puns because there's a few puns in this introduction tonight. <laughs> All right, ready? Are you feeling crabby tonight? Yes. Yay, then you're in the right place. The topic is land crabs tonight. So Ian McGaw gained his PhD in marine biology in 1991 from Bangor University, UK. He currently holds a faculty position at Memorial University of Newfoundland in St. John's, Canada. Yay, Canada! <laughs> his research concentrates on the behavioral and physiological responses of crustaceans to environmental change. More recently, he spent a six-month sabbatical in the Bahamas where he investigated the responses of land crabs to predicted climate changes. This ongoing work further aims to engage local harvesters in a two-way knowledge transfer between traditional historical perspectives of the land crab fishery and current scientific knowledge. So if we can get a round of applause for tonight's speaker, Ian. <laughs> on okay well thank you uh, Emily and thank you uh, everybody else Lynn and uh, Grace for taking me around showing me around and the see and learn program it seems to be a really interesting program bringing people from uh, around the world to discuss some of their research and it seems to be an audience that seems to be enthused I'm used to teaching students who are sitting there staring off into space playing on the phone so hopefully you <laughs> wanted to come here and learn some things. So I go through, I'm going to talk a bit about where I carried out this research. What is a land crab? Describe the different adaptations, both the ecology and physiology for living on land. Look at the importance of land crabs some of the potential threats facing land crabs, and if interested, what can people do on Sabre and Stacia to actually improve the land crab population? So as Emily said, I live in St. John's, which is the most easterly city in North America here on the island of Newfoundland. And every year, faculty can actually take a paid sabbatical. So we can go abroad, yeah, they pay you to go and do research or teaching for a whole year. I decided to just take six months off, and I thought, I don't really want to spend another winter in St. John's. <laughs> this is winter in St. John's. We get a lot of snow. We're the snowiest provincial capital city in Canada, and it just piles up all winter. So I thought, I need to go somewhere that's nice and warm, somewhere <laughs> tropical. And Someone's telling me about this uh, new research station down in the Bahamas on Eleuthera Island. Eleuthera is one of the family or outer islands, so it's not as busy and touristy. But they do have a small research station known as the Cape Eleuthera Institute. And this is out in the middle of nowhere. But it was originally designed as a teaching post for high school students. So rich high school students go there. They spend 100 days in the tropics. They spend $40,000 to do this, but they do all outdoor activities, hiking, canoeing, scuba diving. But one thing that they introduced was them to have a marine science experience. So they spend 10 weeks doing a 10-week research project, and out of that grew the Cape in the far side, the Cape Eleuthera Research Institute, where they brought in scientists who could help the students and help engage them in marine sciences. And so I went out there for six months on a sabbatical, and this is where I came across the, these animals. Now, I know people who are native to the islands won't be very impressed, but when we've only seen crabs in the water and you walk, start walking through the forest and there's hundreds of crabs running through the forest, it's very strange. We're not used to seeing crabs on land. And so I was just walking through the forest and seeing hundreds of these little crabs. And I've been working on crustaceans since my undergrad on his project when I was 20 years old. So it's very different to actually see these land crabs. So I said I've been working on crustaceans for 20 years. If we look at crustaceans in general, they start appearing in the fossil record about 400 million years ago. 
The first brachyurines, or the true crabs, appear between about 200 and 250 million years ago. And today, there's over 67,000 species, ranging from microscopic ones all the way up to the giant spider crab, which is three meters across. And you find them in all habitats, from the deep sea, coastal areas, freshwater, and onto land. Not many have made it onto land. There's just a few crab species. The real ones that are the only ones that are really true land organisms are the isopods. So you might see these, the wood lice, the pill bugs. You get them in rotting wood, sometimes get them in your house. So very few have actually made them onto land. When we look at crabs, crabs probably moved onto land about 125 million years ago. And they didn't, there's lots of different species, but they didn't evolve from one single species. We have what we call convergent evolution, where many different species came onto land and then spread out and evolved into different organisms. They probably moved up through the intertidal zone, so coming up the beach and then slowly evolving to move onto land or through estuaries and into fresh water. Why would an animal move onto land? Well, everything evolved in the sea. So when you move onto land in the initial stages in evolutionary history, there's a lot more food. There's different food, but it's a lot more abundant. There's less competition. There's always competition for space and resources. And so that tends to drive animals into new habitats. When they're first moving onto land, there'll be a lot less predators in the than in the ocean. And on the land, oxygen is much higher levels than you find in uh, the water, and much more stable. The problem for these crabs moving onto land, though, is they're used to reproducing in the water. They're going to have to have some new method or still be tied to water. Respiration. They're breathing aquatic oxygen. Now they're moving into the land. They have to breathe aerial air. And probably the most important one is water loss. In a wet environment, they're not losing water. You come into air, water's evaporating. As water evaporates, the salts in the body become more concentrated. And also excretion. In water, they're able to excrete their wastes. We'll talk about this briefly. They have to develop new methods on land. So what is a land crab? People ask, well, what's a land crab? Well, is it a crab that's found on land? There are degrees of terrestriality of crabs, so true aquatic crabs would never be exposed to air, and this is most of the crabs that you'd find. But there is a gradation of crabs that can live in air from least terrestrial T1 crabs up to the most terrestrial crabs. So a T1 crab would be the typical one you might find in the intertidal as the tide goes out, if you're looking under rocks and stones, some crabs are left stranded there every day as the tide goes out. They don't tend to be that active, so they're moving. They tend to lie under rocks in damp places. They can respire in air, but they're not very good at it. So the short term, they can deal with that few hours while the tide is out, but they have limited ability to actually respire in air. The T2 crabs are a bit better. You might see these around here, the Sally Lightfoot crabs and Fiddler crabs. When the tide goes out, they still live in between the tides, but they tend to be higher up in the intertidal zone. And when the tide's out, they can actually run around and feed quite happily. So they're better adapted, but they're still tied to water. They can't survive for more than a day out of water. So they're still in the intertidal zone, but they're a bit better adapted than T1 crabs. We then have the T3 crabs, super little or super tidal, which means above the high tide mark. So these ones often live in burrows above the high tide mark. They're active in air. We'll have things like the ghost crab and the white crab, the white land crab. But we're starting to see a bit better breathing abilities. We start to see the development of a primitive lung but they still need regular access to water, so these crabs have to dig burrows down into the water table, so they need to keep moist. These ghost crabs will still have to dip themselves in the ocean. One, I think, are the, probably the true land crabs are the T4 crabs, and these are the ones we'll be talking about tonight. These ones can be found at many miles from the ocean. They live in forests, and these are unimodal breathers. They're actually using lungs rather than gills. 
And so what we find is these ones would actually drown if you put them in water. So these ones are living on land. But the why they are put in the T4 section is they're not independent of the water. They still have to return to the sea to lay their eggs and the larvae develop in the sea. So this is, puts them in the T4. T5 crabs, you think, oh, they must be super duper. They can survive out of water. These ones actually need water all the time. They need to keep their gill chambers filled with water. But what they do is they have what they call direct developing larvae. So instead of having larvae that drift in the sea, they often lay them in snail shells that have a few drops of water in bromeliad plants or in small pools. And so this is what puts them as most terrestrial because they no longer are tied to the sea. They can live in a forest all their life throughout the entire cycle. But they're not that tolerant of desiccation like the land crabs, the T4 ones. So from now on, I'll just talk about the G. carcinid, the T4 land crabs. You find them throughout the tropics. Probably one of the most famous one is the Christmas Island red crabs. Those are on all David Attenborough's shows. They show the migrations. But there's other ones in Vietnam, purple crab, the Ascension Island crab. The one we're going to talk about here is the Caribbean black crab, and even brought some for show and tell. The kids have been playing with these this morning. These ones are dead, so they're not going to pinch you. But this, this is a typical, this will be about a big, the biggest uh, black crab would grow to. So highly terrestrial, and because they live on land, they have morphological and behavioral adaptations for living on land and extended activity out of water. So we look at just some basic biology, life cycle. They have to return to the ocean to breed. Usually it's once a year. It's driven by rains, by lunar cycles. So the crabs come down to the water. The females go right to the edge of the water and they shake their abdomens into the ocean and drop off the eggs. The eggs are hatched almost immediately and then they go through several larval stages for about three weeks before they settle on the bottom close to the shore. This is around about seven to nine days, and then they come back en masse, make a migration as these juveniles, and disappear in the forests. There's a question mark there, because these, the, these are the little crabs, and they come back, there's literally millions of them, but nobody really knows what happens to them. They're so small, you see them migrating, and then they just disappear into the forest, and no one really finds them until they're maybe a year or two old, and they've got a bit bigger. So they think they might hide in burrows with adults or just bury in the leaf litter. But this is one stage we don't really know what happens to them. We do know quite a bit about their feeding. They're opportunistic omnivores. That means they'll basically eat anything. But different to the marine crabs, which tend to feed on fish and mollusks and worms, by nature of their habitat, they're primarily herbivores. They're primarily eating leaves seedlings and fruit. Occasionally they'll catch an insect or there'll be a dead animal. They do eat human and animal waste, but mostly these are eating a very poor quality diet of dried leaves. There's occasional cannibalism. You'll see this maybe on the walk. We'll see some small ones, just some legs left. Some of the larger crabs will eat the smaller crabs, especially if there's not no other animal matter and during the drought times and dry times when the seedlings and leaves and green matter disappears. Or if there's very dense populations of land crabs, they tend to start feeding on the smaller crabs. They don't have that many natural predators when they're deep in the forest. Now, what we did, we, we pegged out some crabs on a rope and just had cameras to capture what came down and ate them. And most of the Animals were eaten were birds and night herons, and typically they'd make a crack right through the shell, so they'd stab them with their beak, kill them, and then rip them apart. It does vary by region and species, but in the Caribbean, most of the animals feeding on the crabs are birds, and they tend to be on the edge of the forest. We don't see them going very deep into the forest to track down these crabs. But the real problem, which we'll just talk about, is the problems of moving onto land. The animals are changing from an aquatic habitat to breathing air. And there's going to be a lot of evaporation from the animal. It's going to start to dry out. They might have the ability to find or gain enough water. When you lose water, you 
fluids become too concentrated, their nervous system, heart rate breaks down, or they need specific ions in their diet which they can't find, so the body fluids become too dilute. And finally, in water, it's very easy to excrete your nitrogenous waste. So when you break down proteins in your body, you have to get rid of the nitrogen. So that's why you pee. One thing is to balance water, but you also, that's why your urine smells of ammonia, you're getting rid of that nitrogenous waste. It's very soluble in water, so they can lose it directly across the gills. But on land, they have to urinate, and of course, that's an extra water loss when they may already be losing water. So how do crabs breathe? Well, normally aquatic crabs use gills. So if you take the top of the shell off, they have these large gills chambers. They'll pump in sucking water at the base of the legs, pump it over the gills and out through the mouth. Now, the ones, the crabs we talked about who can live in the intertidal zone, when they're out and about in the air, they seal their chambers and hold water in the gill chambers. They then bubble sort of air into that water. It's a bit like the bubbler in your fish tank and air stone in your fish tank. So they're bubbling and aerating the water in the gill chambers. It prevents them from drying out and collapsing. And this way, they can spend several hours out and about running around. But they'll always need to go and eventually replenish that water supply. Now, when we look at the land crabs, these are T4 crabs. We look at and cut them across. So this will be the bottom of the body, and this will be the top. Their gills are very small, much reduced, and they only really use the gills for water and salt balance. Inside the gill chambers, they have this complex membrane, a sac-like structure known as the epibranchial membrane. It's a sort of folded sac. It's got lots of blood vessels. This is a picture of a coconut crab, and they did a resin cast. Highly vascularized, so they're pumping a lot of blood in there, and these sacs function as primitive lungs. So they're basically pumping air in and out. So they're using lungs to breathe and not gills. And so this allows them to survive on land. As we said, probably the, one of the biggest problems of these crabs when moving onto land is water loss. So we took an aquatic crab out of water. It's going to survive a few hours, maybe a day. It's going to lose a lot of water, but it's primarily going to die from respiratory failure. It's not going to be able to take up enough oxygen. The land crabs, depending on the temperature, the humidity, and such like, and the species, they'll survive anywhere from 5 to 30 days without any water. And they can lose 10 to 30% of their body water. Most of that water they're losing by evaporation through the carapace. It looks hard and tough, but it does let water go out. Excretion as well, they have to urinate. And so when they urinate, they lose a lot of water. They lose a bit of water by respiration, there's some vapor in the water they breathe out, and a bit in the feces, although they are quite dry. Now, insects and arachnids are suited for life on land. They have a waxy coat in their exoskeleton, and so this prevents total water loss. They can also survive a lot more body water loss, and the only way they really lose a little bit of water is in water vapor when they breathe out. They produce solid nitrogenous waste, and this waxy layer actually prevents water loss. We have the same. We have keratin in our skin, just underneath our skin. This is all dead cells, you can see. But we have keratin in our cells, so we're practically waterproof. We use water through sweat glands, but if we lost that waterproof by burns. Most people with massive burns die from dehydration. They just can't keep enough water in them. So these crabs don't have that waxy layer. They're a bit better than the aquatic crabs, but not totally sort of waterproof. And we were just looking at the black land crabs, seeing how long they would survive. We start to see after about 10 days of no water, there's a real sharp drop off in, in uh, mortality. And this was about 20% water loss of the body. So they can survive about 20% water loss in the body before they start to die. We're not very good. We can do 2 to 4% if we're lucky. So they can survive without water, but they're not as good as the insects. So they're going to have to have some mechanism to reduce water loss. They're going to be prone to water loss. How might they do this? Well, the first one is behavior. They're just not there. So you don't tend to see them out and about on dry, sunny days. They're nocturnal. They tend to 
hide in burrows or they dig burrows into the soil. It's a lot cooler and more humid. My student, uh, Bill Bigelow, is just writing this work up from his thesis at the moment. He was looking at the different environments. So he looked at the coppice floor and seeing the, the temperature and uh, humidity. And this printout, as we both said, was very hard to see because the colors are so similar. But on the coppice floor, the temperature ranged between about 19 and 34 degrees C. And humidity varied between about 98 and 45 percent. So animals on the coppice floor were prone to losing water. But in a sinkhole in these cracks in the, between the rocks, we found the humidity only really drops to about 90 percent. So it's 100 percent most of the time. So it isn't a big gradient to lose water. And the temperature is quite stable. So they live in areas, they choose areas to prevent water loss. And this was just looking at percentage water loss in the coppice floor on orange and then in the sinkholes. So they lose a lot less body water loss. I believe with these ones, they were in cages and all ripped their ways out the cages after six days. But first thing is to use some behavior. Choose a habitat or micro habitat to avoid the water loss. They also have seasonal and temporal activity. Most of them are nocturnal. That's why we're going on a night hike. You won't really see them during the daytime. You'll see the odd one. When you have dry seasons, like in the winter, they'll spend a lot of more time in the burrow. They'll hibernate in the burrow and more active on humid days. And we really find what they, gets them going is rains. So again, this is some stuff Bill was doing. He was uh, looking a lot on this, but the blue bars are the amount of rainfall. These sort of triangles are showing the amount of days without rainfall, and then all of a sudden it rained. Really the take home message was, even if you got a tiny amount of rain, the crabs came out. It didn't need to be heavy rain. As soon as it rained, the crabs came out. So they were responding, they sort of thinking they're picking up on vibrations of the raindrops. So it's not so much Days with, it's, it is days without rain, and it doesn't have to be the amount of rain. It's just any rain that they're probably coming out to get. They have excretion mechanisms to reduce water loss as well. So we've shown the kids today in school, we showed them where the crabs poop out of, and also where they pee. They pee out of their faces. So there's a small hole in the fridopore very close to their mouth parts. The kids were like, ugh, when they saw this. But the reason for this is, they need to get as much water back as they can. So they're going to lose some of that nitrogenous waste in the urine. They can only concentrate the urine to a certain degree. And so they need to get some of that water. So they pump it back from the mouth parts into the stomach, but also over the gills. The gills take back some of those essential ions, but they also absorb some water in the gut. Now, they can temporarily tie up that nitrogenous waste so they don't have to get rid of it as uric crystals. And he says insects much better suited for life on land. They don't have to use water at all. They get rid of their nitrogenous waste as solid dry pellets. So this is another mechanism. Crabs can reduce some water loss, but it's not totally efficient. So how do they get water? What's the best way for a crab to get water? It's to drink it. They can, especially in temporary pools, so after rain, they'll come round and you'll see them gathering around pools and drinking water. And also in the mornings, they'll pick up dew off the leaves. Now, the trouble with the Caribbean is there's not a lot of ponds and rivers on these islands. And also the soil is quite porous, especially when we're looking at the Bahamas, it was actually limestone. And so it soaks down very quickly. And so they have to take advantage of this as soon as it rains, but it's not there all the time, so it's not a great source that can be relied on. So what they can also do is they can take water up, suck up through these capillary action from cetal tufts on the legs. So they'll lay down on the soil, and the soil doesn't actually need to be that damp. Would, you could put your hand on it, you wouldn't think it was damp at all, but that would be enough that they can pull up water by capillary action, so the tiny cetal tufts, they'll place them that sort of basically just flatten them 
cells out on this on the, on, the, on the ground, on the soil, or maybe dig down a bit, and then they can suck up water from the soil in that way. And that may be a main way that they're getting water because some of the times the rains are infrequent. They may get water from moist food as well, if they can find it. Now, desert organisms, like desert rats and some of the lizards, they survive nearly entirely on metabolic water, which is when you break down nutrients and you have to breathe in, take in oxygen, two of the byproducts you make, you make energy, that's why you break down food. One is carbon dioxide, which you breathe out, but another one is metabolic water. And desert organisms can eat dry seeds and get enough water and maintain their water balance with metabolic water. The work Bill was doing, it doesn't seem they're able to do this. So they're not efficient enough to maintain that water. It doesn't seem that breakdown of nutrients is a good way to get water. So it's probably drinking it when they can and then the sort of hydrophilic action from the soil. So I've told you all these things about everything you wanted to know about a land crab. Why should we care? Everybody says, oh, I don't care. They're just running around. They're just crabs. Who cares if they're running around in the forest, they're not going to do me or they're not going to be any benefit to us at all. But they are an important source of protein and income. At the moment, it's mostly artisanal. It's for local consumption. It's usually transferred between the islands. But they are being extirpated from many of the islands. So a lot, I was talking to some of the locals, they said most of the crabs that go from St. They get in St. Martin are actually shipped from here. In the Caribbean, three main species, the black land crab, the blue or white land crab, which tends to be lower down in the mangrove swamps, and sometimes they take the smaller red land crab. And there are some iconic dishes. The Jamaica curried crab I actually went down to the old folks' home yesterday, and a nice lady was just telling me all about living in uh, Dominica, and that was her favorite meal, crab back, where they scoop out the crab and they eat the crab and crab back. In the Bahamas, they have crab and dough, and crab and rice. This was, try that, was a bit funky, sort of black, sort of innards, and you dip dough in it. But they also have a long cultural importance. So I understand on Sabre and some of the archaeological sites, they're finding the indigenous Caribbean people actually were eating these thousands of years ago. So 3,000 years in the middens, you find these. But they have crab fests, several days of partying, eating crabs, racing crabs in the Bahamas, in Providence, and also uh, this one's all around the world, so this is in Guam. So they seem to be quite popular. You race crabs, you eat them, you swap ideas and just drink a lot, I think. But they were thought to be so important, so in the Bahamas they had a total lockdown during COVID. They had a curfew. You weren't allowed to be out anywhere unless you were working between, was it 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. So you had to be locked in your house by 6 p.m. got dark and you weren't allowed out until 6 a.m. But they did make an exception. They thought it was so important that people got their crabs that they allowed harvesting of crabs beyond curfew hours. So it is obviously very important to a lot of people throughout the Caribbean. Probably one that people don't know about, and it's probably one of the most important ones, and it ties into the first two talks that we heard, that they're ecosystem engineers, they're gardeners of the forest. So most Caribbean islands, if I'm correct, there's not many earthworms, are there? Depends where you, yeah, in the compass. In, in the Bahamas, they don't have earthworms. And so what the crabs do, they take over the role of the earthworms. They're basically, they dig burrows, so they're aerating the, the, the ground, they're digging down into the ground. They bring in leaves and all things to eat in down in there, so they're bringing nutrients down into the soil, but they also often poop in their burrows, so they're gonna bring in nutrients in this way. This is actually just outside the land crab's burrow, and this one's actually pooping outside the burrow, so it's massive fertilization. They prevent leaf litter building up on the forest floor. So all those leaves, those dead leaves falling, if there weren't any crabs, they'd eventually smother the whole area, smother new seedlings, but they'd also prevent water percolating down into the ground. So they tend to keep the understory clean. And they also prey selectively on seeds and fruits. And so they determine what grows in Caribbean coastal forests. And we'll see what happens if you actually remove them. So they are very important. 
And they're also a biological indicator species. So this was pulled out of, I forget where this was on, a, a grant on the land crab is a bridge species that connects the island's forests with the ocean. It allows transfer of nutrients between the ocean and land. And so they're an important indicator of the health of both environments, not just the land, but the ocean as well. So there's something going on in the ocean and the larvae don't make it, you're gonna have a poor recruitment event. If you're seeing lots of dead crabs or none are returned to the ocean to breed, there's something going on in the forest themselves. And there are lots of threats facing land crabs. So we have over-harvesting, urbanization and development, habitat fragmentation, pollution, removal as pests, invasive species, and climate change. Probably the biggest problem is over-harvesting. People just take too many. I don't, in most areas, if you're fishing for lobsters, you've got seasons, don't you, for lobsters and sizes. There are, there's very few areas that have any regulations for land crabs. You can take as many as you want. There's usually no limitation on size, sex, season, or quotas. So they're sort of more an artisanal harvest. Some species like this, this is the big coconut crab, a robber crab. This is an endangered species that's in the Indian Ocean. But so much was taken to eat and shipped around the world, they're severely threatened. Why? People have been eating these for years and years, but now what we're seeing is food tourism. People are coming to areas, they want to actually try new food. So there's food tourism and there's new markets coming up. So people are now, we can import things all around the world. So I can go to Europe and see lobsters from Maine. You can go to China and see Canadian lobsters there. In Singapore, you see Dungeness crabs from Washington State. And so as soon as markets start opening these, and these are very easy to ship because you can ship them out in air. And so this is probably the main cause is just over harvesting. But it doesn't even have to be to eat. Now they're being shipped around as pets. You can get land crabs on Amazon. So I was looking on Amazon Canada and you can just go online and buy hermit crab. You probably see some of these, but some of the rarer crabs as well from the, they're only found in certain islands like Jamaica. So they are collected from the wild as well. They're not usually ones that you find, you can't breed them because they've got that complex life cycle where they have to go to the ocean and breed. The larvae are delicate. And so people go out and collect these from the wild, ship them all around the world. And they don't survive that well in captivity. You might get one that lives a year, a year or two, but these could live 10 years in the wild. So there is this ongoing over harvesting, whether it's for food or for the pet trade. We then have urbanization. People want to live on some of these tropical islands. And of course, when you live there, you've got to build roads, you've got to build houses, you've got to build facilities. This is actually the migration of red crabs coming back. So you see the whole land just turns red and the crablets crawl up the beach and into the forest. But as we start building roads, and drainage ditches and houses, this disrupts their pathways. They'll either get run over, these concrete can be very hot, and so they get baked, or they just leaves it wide open for predation. It's a great feast for all the birds. We can also then have development, and I pulled this one as a Disney terminal, and there's a lot of controversy in this. So this is a lighthouse point on a Luthra island, and a lot of the people who uh, bought houses on Eleuthera and a lot of the students who are studying there love to go out here because it's total wilderness, unspoilt coppice forest. And was, you couldn't even drive in. You had to hike in out there in beautiful beaches. But Disney bought this whole area. And it's nearly complete now. They've shaved the whole area, removed the forest, and they've built houses and uh, entertainment facilities for the cruise ships to come in. Now here, there's got to be a balance between conservation and community livelihood. It's okay, I think, to say, oh yeah, let's save this area. Look how pristine it is. This is a good forest, not for the, only for the crabs, for everything that lives in that forest. We don't want to see it disappear. But these were the rich people who had their holiday homes or the students. And they did, I don't think they thought enough about the community and Luther's very few opportunities for people to get ahead 
but this could provide lots of jobs and well-paid jobs for people. So you've got to balance it. Okay, we've taken out this area. It's good for the people. The people now have jobs. Their kids can go to school. They can get ahead in life. Maybe put up a crab preserve somewhere else. And I think with all this, there's got to be a balance. You can't just say, we're not going to do anything. We can't just live in the wild. So I think it is a delicate balance and it should come from the community. Now, you don't even have to shave and pave a place to actually disrupt them. So this is actually in the Bahamas, they put in a new line. So they just put, this is for power lines. So they cut through the forest or just a road through the wilderness. And what we find is because a lot of the crabs get predated on the edge of the forest in the open, they're very wary about coming out of these areas. And so what you've basically done is isolated those two populations. It's just even a short road. You might see odd ones on there, but they tend to isolate so you see less mixing and it's also a barrier to migration as well when they migrate back to the ocean. So you don't have to, it doesn't have to be a massive change in the environment to disrupt the animals. Now there is pollution as well, there's always pollution. I'd say the main problem for pollution is the crabs in the ocean, the larvae. They're very susceptible to pollution. We see microplastics all the time. In the Caribbean, you're talking about nutrient runoff, so all the soils and the nutrients getting washed in. Not so much petrochemicals and heavy metals. One they're finding out a lot more about, that they didn't notice a lot, is drugs and hormones. So the female contraceptive pill, we have a biological magnification. It isn't broken down, and so it gets washed out. Even when in treated sewage, it gets washed out into the ocean. They're finding now a lot of uh, antidepressants as well in the water, Prozac and such like. More and more people are on antidepressants. This is getting washed out, and it's affecting all these larvae. They're not developing properly. Some are with a female hormone, are not changing to males or females. We're having others, the whole nervous system, because the antidepressants affect sort of release of uh, chemicals in the brain. It also affects release of chemicals at synapses on the heart and such like. So these are having effects that nobody really knows about. They're just starting to find out about these uh, really messing around. They're all just with molting, they're feeding. And so it could be pollution is main problem, crabs in the ocean. Probably a less of a threat on land. Crabs do scavenge on dumps an animal and human feces. And usually when you get land crabs, they usually bring them in, hold them for a couple of weeks and feed them some fruit or something nice so it clears out anything that you don't want to be in there. What we did notice though is transferring waste into the ground. So they're digging holes into the ground, but they're taking things cardboard into the ground, but plastic bags and used sanitary towels as well are going down into the burrows, they're feeding on them and they're getting worked into the ground. So. There is some areas, especially around dumps, that the crabs are really sort of putting things into the ocean. Now, people came in and said, oh, I'd, I'd like to see some land crabs. Not everybody likes to see land crabs. A lot of now areas in the Caribbean, they're turning over to farming. You're talking about, we're gonna have some nice gardens and everything. That's just setting up a smorgasbord for these crabs. It's a big problem in rice paddies, because in rice paddies, they actually dig into the sides of the levees and then they collapse. They'll go in and eat the rice as well. So they're directly consuming crops. You see them coming down to gardens, eating flowers and plants, digging up the roots. And so not everybody is excited to have land crabs in the environment. They're just removed as pests. They're burrowing, as we said, they're burrowing into people's gardens. They'd like to see them out in the forest, but when they come to the gardens and dig up the plants, I'll look this up. There is actually a fear of crabs called caborophobia, which is probably linked to the fear of spiders. So if you're in your hotel and you open the door and there's all these crabs crawling up the window and the, the mesh or walking around in the side of the hotel, customers always write, so they want to get rid of those crabs, so they're removed as well. There's also problems with tourists getting around these uh, crab migration. They're getting in the way of people. You want to drive places. So a lot, of tour a lot of the locals just drive over these crabs. This is actually in Providencia in Colombia, a small island off Colombia. And it's getting so bad they bought in the army. So now they have armed guards with machine guns and nobody's allowed to drive down those. So they actually are protecting the crabs in some areas. So that when the crabs migrate, 
a few weeks they migrate, the army stops people driving down through these roads, so they actually are protecting the crabs. Now, we have an invasive species as well. So when I was working on a Luther and I first got there, they said, oh, we found a little population of raccoons on the north of the island. The whole island's about 90 miles long. Nobody was really one, worried much. They just wondered how they got there. But this, again, was Bill put out some crab, traps in the forest with some bait. He wanted to look at what was coming to eat the bait, the crabs. But he did find right down south of Luthra. So within two years, they'd traveled the whole length, nearly 100 miles. And the people up in the north, they're blaming the raccoons for the decline in crab populations. Now, different from the herons, which only really tend to pick them off on the edges of the coppice. These ones go right into the coppice. And also, they've got little paws, so they can dig the crabs out. They don't need to have the crabs out running about. They can dig them out. We don't think they're taking the really big crabs, these size ones, but even if they're taking the smaller ones, the juveniles, these ones eventually grow up to be bigger ones, so they're removing them from the population. I don't think you haven't, don't have raccoons here yet, do you? No, yeah, I assume they're going to be... They, I don't know, they're starting to, to pay, pop up all over the Bahamas, and we don't know how they're getting there, whether somebody dropped them off, but there's more and more than St. Martin. Yeah, so they'll be here soon. Yeah, so they're, they're, we don't know how they're getting, but they are really chomping down on the crabs. Not so much of a problem on Caribbean islands, but feral hogs dig up the ground, so they root up the forest, and they actually feed on the crabs, so they dig them up with their snouts. And so they're, especially on the mainland, they're really sort of destroying a lot of the crab population. And this one is actually, this is one where you see on these, this is where they make all the nature programs with David Attenborough. So the red crab, the Christmas Island red crab, somehow these yellow crazy ants got onto the island. I think they're probably in sh fruit shipments and they're starting to spread out all over the island. Now they're only small, but what they do is they sting the ant, the crabs around their eyes and in the joints between the legs and it kills them. That amount of the formic acid going in and kills them quite quickly. So a particular problem is they migrate because the crabs have to migrate through ant territory and they're starting to spread further over Christmas Island. So there's a lot of money going in to try and eradicate these ants, which probably they'll never do, but to try and control them because they're having a drastic population. They're killing off whole areas of crabs. There's always climate change as well. So as the uh, first speaker said, there'll be an increase in temperature in the Caribbean. There'll be more intense rainfall over shorter periods. But more important, there's going to be an increase in the number of dry days, especially in the summer. So the days without rain, the periods between those are going to increase. And we know land crabs are relying on that rain. So we looked at actual feeding of them during dehydration. So they were dehydrated for zero control for four days or eight days. And we fed them some novel foods lettuce, apple, or fish, just so they weren't showing a preference for anything. But the common pattern was the more they were dehydrated, the less they ate. And sometimes we tried over 10 days and they just stopped feeding altogether. Probably the problem with this is when you feed, you've got to produce saliva and gastric juices. So that's taken away from the water balance. When you also start digesting that food, then you've got that nitrogenous waste. You have to urinate and, and get rid of it. So what we see is a decline in feeding activity. We looked at sort of, Bill's been doing a bit more on uh, seeing how long they can survive, and they probably can survive any drought period. But the problem is, it's not gonna, the increased dry days is not gonna kill them directly, but it's gonna make them weaker. They're eating less. They're spending more time in the shelter, less time out looking for water. So weak crabs are going to be affected by other stresses, by diseases that are going to take them off. They're going to have a lower reproductive success because they can't migrate to the ocean. They haven't got as much any reserves. People say, well, what happens when the crabs are gone? So this is actually on Christmas Island, uninvaded. This is one year after the ants went gone there and killed all the crabs, three years and ten years. So in this mature forest, what we've got is mature trees, large trees, and the understory is quite clean. They clean up all the waste in there, the leaves, 
It allows water to percolate and nutrients to percolate down the ground to feed the mature forest. Even after a year, we start seeing all the weeds coming up. Three years, the weeds just getting some of the spindly trees, and then the 10 years, we get sort of the small, fast-grown trees. What this does is a couple of things. First of all, these dense undergrowth, they take all the water and nutrients for the mature trees. So the mature trees are now competing with these fast-growing sort of smaller bush shrub type, type things. There's less water getting down deeper into the deep root systems of some of the mature trees. There's less nutrients percolating down because the smaller trees are taking them up. And eventually what you'll have is next big hurricane will rip through. It'll just take out the weakened mature trees and we'll have a different forest. We won't have the mature forest. We'll have scrubland, open scrubland forest. So there is a big effect of crabs on the forest. We think of crabs are just in isolation, but they are very important for the environment. As you see that this is actually just in an area of Christmas Island. It's within 10 years, the crabs are gone and it's totally changed. So what can you do? Well, first of all, if you're here in the Caribbean, decide if it's something that you want to get together and do. Maybe people say, well, I don't care about crabs and I want a more greeny lush forest. I don't like these big trees. So these are just some suggestions only that you can try. I think with these small island states, it has to be local stakeholders who are making the decisions. Now, if we are talking about the whole of the US West Coast, it basically needs to be scientists and the government because there's so many different people with competing interests. But here, you've got people who rely on the crabs. They like to eat the crabs. Maybe they're making a living from the crabs. You've got tourists and such like. So the local stakeholders have to decide. And a bit like the, I talked about the Disney thing, you've got to have a balance. You can't say to people, no, we're not going to catch any crabs. And likewise, people can't say, well, we're just going to catch as many as we want. So it needs to be all lake, local stakeholders decide if I want to do this. Let's decide amongst ourselves, and the government scientists can help advice if you need it. I think the first thing is increased awareness. Share information. Yeah, so I said, think about the local stakeholders. What can you do? I think first thing is to have, share this information. When I was down at the old folk home, they were telling me all about crabs. And people who are working with them, the crabbers know a lot more than scientists do. We get a glimpse into things. We can set up controlled experiments. But some people have been out years in the field. And this is where Bill was starting a project. He didn't finish it. He was trying to gauge the interest of... Uh, local people. So what we did is we want to incorporate the importance of local and traditional knowledge in conservation science. So we started some land crab surveys on the Luther in the Bahamas. We didn't get them finished. But it's really people who crab and people who don't crab to actually find out what information they know. Because a lot of the things is just word of mouth, oral tradition. And as the older folk die off, we were finding, especially in the Bahamas, that young people aren't interested in eating crab. They want to go to McDonald's or play on the phones. So, but this could be a, a great sort of project to do in the SS Islands to see what interest there is. We can actually gauge knowledge and then sort of detail it so it's in a library somewhere if everybody wants to know in future years what people know about the crabs. Because the local crabbers are know a lot more than scientists will. They're out, they know when they're running and such like. I mean, you can have awareness of migrations. This doesn't need to be like they do in some areas, but you can just tell people when the tourists are coming, take care driving, there's crabs migrating, so they're not sort of thinking, oh, this is like Candy Crush. We can see how many crabs we can <laughs> run over. It does get quite drastic. This is in actually Christmas Island, so they actually close the roads. Like I said, in Providentia, they bring in the army to stop people driving. I'm not saying you do this here, but they actually make crab walkways over the road so the crabs actually climb up and over so they're not run over on the road. How big are those? Those, are, those crabs, they're about the same size as these ones. 
So, so they're, they're roughly the same size, yeah. And they're, those adult ones climbing over there. These are baby crabs. And a simple thing here, like if you've got grates, is just to put a piece of wood over it while they're migrating back in so they don't all fall down here. But yeah, you don't have to do much. You just need to tell the tourists to take care on those roads so they don't think they're sort of playing a, a crab crush game. And they said, I think there should be community-led sustainable harvesting regulations. They did this in Vietnam. They saw a massive increase in their population. So rather than just grab every crab, have a minimum size to allow some of them to at least breed and go back to the ocean. Again, talking to the lady in the old folks' home, they said they love to eat the eggs. That was the best part of the crabs. But that's the next generation. So if you said, well, maybe let's not eat the eggs and let them hatch into other crab into mature crabs. Males can mate with two or three females, so you could harvest twice as many males as females. That's going to allow them to breed. Or you can have quotas where you say, oh, well, you can harvest this amount, and it leaves some crabs to replenish the stocks. Now, what they did do in Andros, which has been very successful, is a crab preserve, where they've closed off an area and allowed the crabs to breed, so it's a no-take zone. This could be done here very easily, just people would agree, okay, in this area of the forest, we won't go crabbing. But it can be a bit more profitable. It can be used for education and outreach and also as ecotourism. So they've done it in some areas where they build a, a walkway through the forest. You take guided tours, you pay five, ten dollars to do this. And then you can even add to that area. So I know they've done this with lobsters where they put little shelters for the lobsters, but you can make shelters, terracotta shelters, decorate them, put them in the forest, or put a small, shallow, waterproof bowl in there so water collects, the crabs have got something to drink out of, and then the shops sell crab wares, little crab ornaments, crab t-shirts, might as well cash in on it and do the sort of eco-tourism thing and just put up some notice boards. So they've done this and they actually, this has been very successful in the Bahamas. Of course, this all takes money, so organize a committee, seek some funding. There's a number of ones that do actually fund this interaction between scientists and locals, but also just as conservation mechanisms and environmental mechanisms as well. So there's these. I looked at this. This isn't available in the Caribbean, in the Dutch Antilles. It isn't some of the other ones. But this was a success story where the purple land crab in Vietnam was almost extinct on Chan Island. So they got the locals together and locals started marking the crabs the certain size. So the smaller crabs, they put a colored dot on them, which would be lost when the crab molts. And nobody would take these smaller crabs. They then got money to set up an ecotourism thing where people came in and looked around. And it became very sustainable. The people were making money off the ecotourism, but the crabs came back and there was enough for them to sell and eat as well. So. There are ways to work on this. And again, these are just some suggestions, but hearing about the forest and forest replenishment, crabs are very important for the forest. And so these two things probably go hand in hand. So that sort of wraps it up. I guess the take home message is land crabs do have mechanisms to survive on land, but they're not as efficient as their insect cousins. They're not only good to eat, they're also very important for the environment and they might act as important indicators of a healthy ecosystem. Different species are, or populations are under threat or may be endangered. Black crabs, they're doing okay. Some islands are fine. Other islands like Nassau and I think St. Martin, because of the population, they've all been fished out. But as soon as somebody finds a way to get these into Asia or finds a commercial market, they'll start to become endangered. So thanks everyone for your attention. Just to thank some of the people, people see in Stacia, Nick Higgs and Bill Bigelow and some of the funding operations. So if there's any questions, I'll try and do my best to answer them. It may do. So what, the, what they're actually keying in is on some of the, mic, on the big rains. So if you have some of these big rains that don't come on. The, so it's, it's, it's complex. It's temperature. It's day length and light rains and also lunar cycles. It, it varies from area to area. In the Bahamas, it's sort of April, May time with the sort of big tides. They usually 
what the lunar cycle is, it signifies the big tides, so the big tides come up further and everything, and so it's tied, but it's also the rains have to come as well for them to go there, so if they do, if there is a change in rains, they're not going to make that migration. Mm -hmm. Let's go for front and then, but yeah. Okay. Um, you were talking about the crab life cycle, you mentioned that the females are going over rocks, laying the eggs into the sea. Yeah. When do they get fertilized? So, they can, when crabs mate, it depends on the species, they can hold, so the male has spermatophores, which he puts into the female. They can hold those, depending on the species, for a couple of years. Not usually in the land crabs, they usually migrate down, they usually mate higher up in the, in the forests, and then the females, like, actually will stay at dig burrows in the forest for a couple of weeks, letting the eggs mature, and then she'll go down. So usually that they're breeding probably a few weeks to a month beforehand. And so do the males migrate down as well? No, the males don't usually come down. The males go down just to sort of on, above the, the sea, and that's where they'll mate and breed, and then the females will go down. And, and some do get washed off the rocks, and then they'll drown those females. Should I have somebody? Yeah. We, we don't know, actually. Hmm? Oh, sorry, yes. So somebody was, like, asking how old these crabs will be. And I just... We don't know. They think that normally these crabs might be five or ten years old. They're very hard to age, actually. What, so I'm taking some of these is actually inside their... The only thing is when, when they cast off the shells, everything goes. But they do have enamel teeth inside their gut and the gizzard. And they may be able to age them that way, you'll actually take a section down through, a very thin section down through the teeth and look that way to see if we can count rings on the trees. You can't do it on every crab or every species, and some people are still saying, I still don't believe that. But they think about five to ten years. It's so hard to age them because you can't put a mark on the shell because they cast it off every time they molt. And so a lot of it is guessing. So they once thought lobsters could live 150 years, and now they think the maximum is maybe 60 years. But yeah, that's one thing that would be interesting. We need to know how long they live, when do they first start breeding, and such like. How often do they molt? It depends when they're... So the question was, how often do they molt? When they're young, they could be molting every few weeks. When they get older, larger ones will molt maybe once a year. And again, depending on crustaceans, some crustaceans have a terminal molt where they'll molt one last time and then they'll just stay like... They could stay like that for years where some crustaceans molt throughout their lives, they'll just get older and bigger and bigger and molt. So when they get older, it's usually once or twice a year, but the juveniles will go every few weeks when they're very small, so they grow quite rapidly. Just a bit like young humans, they grow rapidly, have a growth spurt. And yeah, like, there's somebody up to, yeah. Uh, so, you had that plot in the experiment where you did a, it was like a drought experiment, right, over a year to 10 days. Yeah. 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 So the question was on one of these things: Why were the crabs eating more apple than uh, some of the other things that might have had more or less water in? Actually, when we did that, lettuce has the most water. So we offered them lettuce, apple, and fish. Fish has the highest amount of nutrients, energy value, than apple, and lettuce is low. Nutrient lettuce is highest in water. So, yeah, it wasn't actually, it didn't seem to be a water thing. And they don't seem to be very good extract. And we did do some things, rehydration experiments, looking at the blood osmolality and feeding them different things. And they don't tend to, it doesn't seem to be a food is a very good way of rehydrating. Let's grab something. Can smell? Yeah, they Can smell terrible. <laughs> Yeah, they, they do. So the question was, can crabs smell? We did this with the, the kids this morning. We had great fun. They, they use their antenna to smell, so they waft their antenna around. So we got the little kids pretend to be crabs wafting their antenna around, and then they got to pick up cake with their crab claws. So they can smell, and it is, especially in water, they're extremely good at picking up tiny molecules. It's not as efficient in air, because air doesn't carry as much smell, but they, they do. They smell with the antenna, so they don't have noses, but the antennae flick and waft and they pick up small particles. Grab somebody at the back. In, uh, in the Bering 
see any of your land crab examples? We see crabs in large biomass. Is that all crabs? Do they all form large biomass? So the question was, do crabs always form large biomasses? And the answer to that is it depends on the species. Some species are quite aggregative. Land crabs, they're sort of all around the area. Spider crabs, we find them in large aggregations, but lobsters are very territorial, so they'll fight, and so they'll defend a territory. Some other crabs, so it depends on the species. Some crabs you will find aggregating in areas that have high food amounts, but even lobsters, they've shown that actually lobsters will space themselves out almost perfectly so they defend an area. So it depends on the species. Some are territorial, others are aggregative. So yeah, and, and land crabs are not particularly aggregative. You'll see them in burrows, but they're not sort of, there's not like five crabs in a burrow usually. What's their home range? That's another thing. So the question was, what was their home range? And we were trying to find that out and we didn't know, we, we put some uh, receivers in again. Bill wasn't able to complete this sort of things because of COVID lockdowns but we were going to ho hopefully see where they moved to, if they had a home burrow they always came back to. But again, with the lockdowns, we weren't able to get out and do that. Yeah, we've got somebody. <laughs> okay, I've got what, another. Yeah, so the question was how do crabs interact with the world? So what senses do they have? So they do have eyes. The eyes are actually quite efficient, actually compound eyes. So they are compound eyes. They can swivel them right round. So they can pick up very small shadows and everything. So the eyes are quite good. The antennae for smell. And one thing we found out, they heal with their legs. So, so the ears and the legs. So Bill did an and myself did an experiment. We had this crab. We called him Harry. And we, we actually trained him to feed. So we gave him one beep, an electric beep, and he walked forward. Gave him two beeps, and he actually walked back into the food. Three beeps, he walked left, and four beeps, he walked right. So we actually, they can hear the, these beeps. And so one day, Harry was very bad. He pinched us, so we just ripped all his legs off in anger. Yeah. And then we played the, the beep. One beep, he just sat there. Two beeps, nothing. Three beeps, nothing at all. Four beeps, didn't move. So we figured if you pull a crab's legs off, he goes deaf. <laughs> but they do, they do actually hear with the legs. They've got tiny hairs on the legs that pick up vibrations. So they are actually, they're amazing things. So I can, I can have crabs in my lab linked up to a heart rate monitor. And I can walk in the door, they can be across the room and their heart stops instantly so they know I'm in the room. And I don't know what they're picking up on, but it might be vibrations, it might be shadows. So they, they are pretty good actually at sensing the environment around them. Uh, <laughs> are, you, are you sure this research you're doing is, is real? Like with, uh, if you're coming to conclusions that you pull the crab's legs off. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, is the other research a similar kind of conclusion you're coming to? So, sort of. <laughs> I don't know. You mentioned like if you walk on the other side of the room and you felt like something hurt their heart, their heart stops. Like was that kind of true? Yeah. 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 So someone was asking like when I walk in the room, that do they turn the hearts off? And these are very different. So we're doing a lot of work on on the heart and everything. And crabs shut their heart off all the time. So when they're not stressed, we see a pattern, very regular pattern starts to develop that love, maybe five, 10 minutes, the heart will be beating, and then it just stops for anywhere from 30 seconds to a couple of minutes, starts up again. Sometimes they can shut the heart down for 10 minutes at a time. People still don't, this is very common in most species, they stop and start the heart, and we still don't know why. We think maybe it's an energy saving mechanism. They're loading up with oxygen, there's enough oxygen in the blood, they don't need to engage the heart, they've got a low metabolism, there's enough oxygen stored in the blood to support things. But yeah, we don't know why they do it, but it's a common feature among most crabs. They'll stop the heart, and especially when they get, when they're unstressed. So when they're very stressed, they'll stop it for two or three seconds, and then it'll start up and usually get faster and faster. But when there's no one in the room and they're slowing down, they'll actually stop and start the heart.
quite regularly for minutes, for hours at a time. We've got traces where the parts stopped and down and everything. So we don't know. We think it's probably an energy saving mechanism. Did you collect those with your hands? Oh, so the question was, do I collect these with my hands? Yes. <laughs> These are dead, but yeah, picking them up across, across the back. But, but yeah, of course you get pinched all the time. I've had like blood sort of coming out the hands. These ones, one that size, if it's small fingers will break them. They'll just crack them like this. I could put a wine glass in that clause and it just crash like this. So they're, they're that powerful. They give you a fright when you get the actual power behind that one of those. It'll crack your fingers, just break it. And when you're not looking and they get you, it's a real shock. It's so painful. It, the actual power behind that. So we put them into crusher cores, and they can put about 100 kilos. One like that could probably put 70 to 100 kilos of crushing power in that. That things, yeah, they're, they're extremely powerful. Like even small crabs, and yeah. So if you, so if you pick them up across the back, they, this is the, the way you'd pick up a, a crab across the back, and then they can't reach around. They can only get the claws around this way, so all the crabbers. But if you're not looking, sometimes you're not looking, and they'll yeah. give you a good pinch. People say you'll oh, put them on the ground and then they'll let go, but you've got to have the gumption to be not screaming, <laughs> and they don't let go straight away. And if you start to move, they ah, crunch. And, <laughs> and if you rip the legs off, they don't usually like let go. The claws just then go into a tetanus and just crunch on. What's the best way to get a crab to release? It depends. Some, sometimes, like people, you're just panicking, sometimes rip them off. But like I said, the claws go into a tetanus. These land crabs, if you put them down, you, you can stand the pain and let them, for, like after about 20 seconds, they'll start releasing and then run away. But, but you've got to have the sort of gumption to not, ah, like screaming, and to actually put them down. And, and if you feel, you feel them release, and then, oh, you pull, and they've still got you, they'll give you another good pinch. And... <laughs> so, guys, we're... Um... We love that there's the enthusiasm from this presentation. You were fantastic. Yeah, and thank you for uh, being a great got audience. Drivers, dinners, people who have to carry on. But Ian is having dinner here. I'm sure he will be happy to continue to answer your questions. Come on the night hike tomorrow. And uh, he's here for a couple days. Yeah. So keep asking questions, but we need to get going on the venue and be fair to everyone else. So thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you. <laughs>